Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Fringe Show. I hope those of you who managed to take a long weekend had a wonderful long weekend. I'm your host, Nicholas Larmer. Today, I'm joined by Mr. Herman Pretorius. Herman, I've been trying to ensnare you in the grip of the show for a while now, and I'm very glad to have succeeded finally. Yes. No, I mean, uh, liberty apparently only goes so far in this organization. <laughs> apparently. We are also joined today by Dr. John Indris. John, how are you doing? Very well, and uh, great to be back on the show. Thanks, Nick. Good, good to have you back with us. Right, let us get into our first news story of today, and this is the somewhat bizarre situation going on with the uh, National Assembly, the Speaker of Parliament's position. So, um, Pisa Ngokula had her home, the Speaker of Parliament, had her home raided last week, Tuesday, by the police, who were apparently looking for evidence of corruption. National Prosecuting Authorities Investigating Directors raided her uh, Johannesburg home. And um, on Thursday, she announced that she was taking, quote, special leave from her role in Parliament. She's also filed an urgent High Court application to interdict law enforcement authorities from arresting her. And I believe that that's going to be heard very soon. Uh, according to her, there is no case against her. Parliament has already I think appointed the deputy speaker as uh, the acting speaker for now. It's not entirely clear to me what it is that she's got getting in big trouble for, or more accurately, why she's getting in trouble for the things she's getting in trouble for right now. Um, the the allegations against her are uh, concerning corruption and bribery charges of I think around two point three million rand relating to her time as the defence minister. Um, there's also allegations against her for when she gave ANC members a lift in a uh, jet. There's actually a whole range of scandals <laughs> attached to her political career over the years. Um, so there's quite a lot of things to pick out there. Uh, the National Prosecuting Authority says that they have a number of strong witnesses and they have much evidence. So her attempts to get her arrest dismissed are uh, really not going to work. Um, they, in fact, they explicitly said that she does not have a right not to be arrested. No such right exists in law. The case against her is strong. So that's all quite interesting. At the same time, she was also facing a scandal in Parliament relating to her apparently overpaying the Secretary of Parliament, who was recently appointed, or at least relatively recently appointed, uh, and then allegedly lying to Parliament about this. So... A lot of things sort of seem to have crashed down on her head all at once. But, John, let me start with you. Why now? What is this? Uh, you know, there's a lot of senior people in government who have various, you know, cases that could be made against them regarding corruption. And yet, nothing really gets done, or they get slow walked, or they end up in some process somewhere. This kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah, um, I think Nick, it took us by surprise as much as it must have done uh, much of the public. And the most surprising thing about the story is how it does not follow the playbook. You know, so uh, we, we sort of become used to senior leaders in government and the ANC being accused of corruption. And then it being waved away, being referred to the Integrity Commission, you know, being pushed somewhere under a rug, swept under a carpet and going away. And that is the most puzzling thing of what we're seeing with the speaker here, which is that the uh, law enforcement authorities actually did go to raid her home, uh, actually did issue a warrant for her arrest. Um, and the question now is why, why is this happening? It's uh, very, very perplexing. I think we don't have an answer on that yet. Um, we've discussed it internally. We think one possibility would be that there's internal faction fighting within the ANC. And so there's some scores being settled. Uh, and the speaker who used to enjoy cover maybe has lost her political cover and is now being exposed and vulnerable to prosecution. Uh, and another possibility is that this could be driven by pre-election jitters where the ANC recognizes that one of its vulnerabilities is being seen as not being um, strong on crime and accountability and saying with uh, two months to go to the, to the election, uh, now's the time to do something about it. Let's find somebody that we can just put out there 
um, and point to if we need to, to prove that we are serious about corruption. But it does all seem quite puzzling. Uh, and what is also intriguing, though maybe not that surprising, is the response of the speaker herself to what has been happening, uh, which is sort of to make up the rules as you go along in your favor. For example, the special leave provision, uh, I don't think such a provision exists in Parliament. If anything, it would be Parliament that puts the speaker on leave and not the speaker who puts herself on leave. Um, but she went ahead and did it anyway, so she she went and, and gave, her, gave herself special leave. And then when she was meant to be arrested, said, you know, I'm going to ask a judge to instruct the prosecuting authorities not to arrest me and say they're not allowed to. Um, it is yeah, very much, in, in my view, an example of writing the rules to suit yourself. Nick. Yeah, the whole thing is sort of a bit odd. Um, Herman, what do you make of all this? Uh, it's sort of... You know, I'm just kind of struck once again by how the sort of timing, everything kind of fell on her in the space of a week, uh, where she went from being um, sort of not particularly noticed in the national dialogue to, you know, being at the center of this huge firestorm. I think that is the strongest indication that there's <clears throat> that this is quite clearly political theatrics of some kind. It's not a question of whether this is a contrived set of circumstances, I think. It is who is contriving the circumstances and to what end. And it might be in all of the above situation, uh, where it might be factional battles within the ANC. Um, it might be uh, the ANC looking for a relatively low-risk sacrificial lamb. Um, or another possibility is that it might be some some flavor of factional battles, but with one of the ANC's outside factions uh, in Kontu Siswe. We must remember that um, she was the Minister of Defense and Veterans Affairs when um, the Gupta plane landed at the military air force base. So she, the minister has clearly quite been, you know, at, at the heart of several con controversies. I think there's actually a very good piece on this uh, by Business Day's parliamentary correspondent, Linda Ensor, that you can go read. It's, it's quite good. But the, the suddenness of this escalation is quite clearly someone putting their finger on some button or a scale somewhere. And what could be possible is that she's considered a Zuma loyalist um, for uh, the, the, the fact that uh, Zuma was always very close to the military and intelligence clusters within his government, sort of like a Pievir Burta, where his natural alignment wasn't to the economics or the social cluster, it was to the more military muscular wings of the state that Zuma uh, uh, had strong relationships to during his presidency, and that made sense within his background. So her being Zuma proximate might be the start of an ANC response to the MK rise of MK saying, look, um, you might come for our branches and our voters, but we also have the ability to escalate from our side. We also hold some cards in our hands of the people who were close to you when you were president. And uh, imagine the pressure this minister, Minister Mapis Ankakula, might now uh, come to um, in terms of possibly being prosecuted, pressured to become a witness for um, the government should the need uh, or witness for the state should the need ever arise. And just imagine what sort of secrets um, she could with a plea deal or a protection deal um, come forward with some uh, things about the Zuma presidency. Everyone who's currently in the cabinet was also there in the Zuma era, but this could be a very delayed and a sort of a, an attempt at a, at a display of force and muscle from the ANC side, but most likely, um, Nick, I think, as, as you once pointed out, when opposition parties get damaging information about people within the ANC, it's quite often the case that these are factional battles within the ANC and the opposition being used within that. So it's probably uh, an all of the above situation where there are so many interests aligning here, a sacrificial lamb, um, some sort of uh, removal for, for a battle of the ANC parliamentary caucus after the election. Um, but then there's also the, the escalating tension between the ANC and its, you know, Zuma uh, uh, aligned politicians and powerful figures who might be bargaining chips in a rather contra convoluted game of political chicken. 
So if your theory is indeed correct, and it does in fact turn out that this is something to do with the kind of Zoom faction having the, the law brought down upon them, um, I would like to point out to the NC's leadership, although I have a feeling they might not be watching this particular episode, but maybe they will, that you could have avoided this all if you had acted on this stuff long ago. Um, the ANC would probably not be in the same electoral mess that it's in currently if it had acted against some of the sort of state capture people in the beginning. It uh, it could have knocked these opponents out before they were able to form their own political party, which is now threatening to you know dethrone them in at least one province and possibly cripple them nationally. Um, Ramaphosa had the backing of many in the party and the country and the law, <laughs> and he could have used it to win at tremendous factional battle but the ANC has every time it's been faced with making any sort of difficult choice chosen the choice of I ah, will just put it off till next time party unity uh, you know we've just got to keep everyone on board the ship we can't you know uh, break the rule we can't we can't toss some of us under the bus because then maybe it'll set a precedent where all of us can be tossed under the bus um I think the expression is hoist by their own petard I think very much but that has been the case in this situation. Nick, something that we must also just bring into into the the, the sort of consideration of where this uh, sudden move might be coming from. Part of Ramaphosa's most significant political strength has been in his rather, I don't know if it was deliberate, but his rather beneficial and shrewd positioning of he is both president of the country, leader of the ANC, and leader of the opposition in one. In the sense that businesses, the CR17 campaign, uh, could uh, rely on the support from business because Ramaphosa was the anti-Zuma. He was the leader of the opposition going into the ANC. He was the 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 the, the new broom that might bring in the ANC's sort of uh, reformists and pragmatists back into power. So in that sense, he was the guy to back because the ANC in itself is a battleground and Ramaphosa must win. So and he's the underdog, so he needs the backing of business and so on. But on the other hand, he was also the leader of his party and the leader of the country. Right. And what this decision now puts him in an awkward position is he can know he cannot be all three things here. He must choose to at least be one or two of these things, because if there's acting on Zuma allies or on ANC opponents, then he can't play the leader of the opposition card anymore as he used to. So again. This kicking that the can down the road um, is 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 actually now costing the ANC not only uh, in, in very real terms having the corruption scandal before the election that they might want to use, but also it just indicates again what a weak leader Ramaphosa has been. That he has not Zuma might have had had many mistakes, but he understood power and his his government was motivated and the speaker Alekumbete was motivated for a specific direction that is the preservation of Zuma. Ramaphosa, it's it, it being so difficult to understand what's going on here is partly because Ramaphosa is just such a weak leader that it's not clear whether he would benefit or not from this. It's just a, a sort of a, a, a look know, and see approach. John, just to the final question to you, in many countries around the world with, with well-functioning democracies, uh, the speaker of a political, you know, who's aligned closely with one political party, having a huge corruption scandal and possibly ending up being arrested just a few months before an election would usually hurt that party's chances at the polls. So firstly, my first question to you is, do you think this will sort of cut through the corruption noise that is so, you know, there's so much noise at the moment that it's very difficult to hear an individual corruption story, uh, I think, amongst the general public. Um, but, uh, you know, will it, and if it does cut through, will it be to the ANC's benefit or detriment? Um, there's one case that this shows, ah, you see Ramaphosa is finally cracking down on the corrupt. Or the ANC is so corrupt that even their most senior people in the country's institutions are uh, compromised. What do you make of that? So I think on the first one, I think that the voting public has become so inured to the association of the ANC with corruption that one additional scandal makes no difference at all. I don't think that's going to persuade one person to vote against the ANC or for the ANC. It makes no difference. And on the second issue, can the ANC leverage this as a, sort of a symbol of its decisiveness on dealing with corruption? I think it's too late in the game now. Um, if they were hoping to use this for the, for the election, um, you know, they would have had to have started a year ago with this, um, and now it's too late. So I think ultimately 
um, this, uh, the trouble that the speaker finds herself in will not have any influence on the election itself. And okay, let's Nick, move just, on. Just a quick, oh, go ahead. Very, very quickly, you, your point of speakers in general, it is quite unusual for a, for a constitutionally neutral position like a speaker to go to a, to to sort of former ministers. Usually in parliamentary democracies, the speaker is someone who has support from both the well, the government and the opposition benches, and it can be trusted as a as a sort of a, a, a an honest broker in parliamentary contests. It's quite bizarre in South Africa. I think since you know the end of the speakership of Maxi Sulu, that he was the last speaker, ANC speaker, uh, who who really had the respect of parliament generally, I think the respect of public, of the public, and wasn't actually a, a former minister aligned to government sentiment. It's a very weird situation. Um, and, and you know, the, 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 the emasculation of parliament is, is one of the real damaging legacies of the Mbeki era. Okay, let's move on to our next story. And this is about the African Transformation Movement or the ATM, as it's usually called. The ATM is a little bit weird in that it was founded um, in 2018 and it's been slightly more successful than some of the other kind of uh, small parties that you don't hear that much about. They have two seats in Parliament. They have a seat in the Eastern Cape and the KZN provincial legislatures. And they also have some important, um, uh, what are they called, uh, councillors in, in various municipalities, including, I believe, in Durban. Um the ATM has almost always aligned with the ANC when it came to forming coalitions or that kind of thing. But they are, uh, we, we got a little bit of a taste of what the party th uh, is is promising to the uh, public this election. Um, and they kind of launched a manifesto, which was, as far as I can tell, a, like a little bit of a checklist of every single kind of populist uh, idea in the South African body politic. Um, so firstly, they're very tough on the sort of law and order stuff. Um, they want to reinstate the death penalty. Um, their leader, while launching his, the manifesto, said, quote, if you look at neighboring countries just here in Botswana, they have a death penalty and no one is complaining about criminals. South Africa is see seen as a safe haven for criminals because our laws are saying baby to a criminal. Under the ATM, if you are a criminal, rest assured the law will say dog to you. Um, we are. Uh, they, he promised also to tell cops to shoot people if their lives were even vaguely threatened. Uh, he said that the problem with ESCOM was that corrupt people were stealing the money and sabotaging everything and if they just did proper maintenance on the coal stations and we wouldn't need any of this fancy renewable energy stuff. Um, he said that um, uh, South Africa needed a farming revolution and that everyone in the country must be given a plot of land so that they can work it. He also wants to build a factory in every single neighborhood and basically uh, completely end all trade so that we can focus on producing everything for ourselves. Um, lots of this kind of uh, interventionist, nationalist type stuff. Um, sort of an interesting, I think, sort of checklist because it is just so... Uh, so similar to, to I think, I, you know, I think everyone who's talked politics in South Africa for any serious amount of time has probably come across quite a few of these ideas. Um, John, what do you make of their manifesto? I mean, who knows how well the ATM is going to do this time. I suspect some of their lunch will be eaten by the MK party, uh, which is kind of interesting because ATM has long been associated with Zuma. He allegedly helped start the party uh, and it was also formerly the party of Jimmy Money before he left to join the EFF. What do you make of their manifesto? Well, I think there's one tick box on that checklist that was not ticked, and that was build the wall. Uh, but I think apart from that, pretty much all of them were were, were ticked. Um, and as you say, it's, uh, 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 I think, an attempt to gain access to so there's a more conservative and more desperate part of the electorate. Um, and certainly, I think the more desperate part of the electorate is growing every day. You know, So this idea of vigilante justice, shooting to kill, sending the police out there, no more human rights is very attractive to more and more people who are beset by crime in this country. Um, it does seem to me like this manifesto was written by a party that does not consider itself to be at great risk of finding itself in government uh, and is therefore able to you know, make whatever promises it chooses. 
Um, and beyond that, I would agree with your point. It reflects this very interventionist, statist uh, mindset. The state has got to fix everything from uh, crime uh, to building factories in every district to giving everybody a farm and everybody should farm. Uh, you know, it's, he, yeah, it's pretty explicitly much explicitly said no privatization of ESCOM. Yes, exactly. So the state has to stay at the center of everything of society and the economy. Um, and that is the model we've been sort of following for a few years now. That doesn't work particularly well. So um, let's hope that their fear of being voted into high office into government is not uh, does not materialize. Nick, uh, Herman, what do you make of this party's manifesto? Well, <clears throat> it, it, it's difficult to take it seriously as a manifesto. It's, it's not like it's the EFF. Um, earlier this year, I mean, last month, um, we published a paper looking at the seven fundamental pillars of the EFF's economic policy. Um, and you walk away reading that paper that was written, that was commissioned from Ivo Fechter and published for the IRR. Uh, you walk away from that paper and you understand that with the EFF, whatever the adolescence of their political behavior might be, they, um, they, there's, there's some substance, there's, there's some school of thought anchoring uh, the EFF somehow. So it, it, but, but this really seems lacking in, in, in that. So for me, where this manifesto becomes useful is an affirmation of our polling findings, actually. Um, if, if if you need a party that is so ideologic that is as far ideologically speaking from the IRR as I think it is probably possible to be, and yet their priorities are quite clearly job creation and crime, um, then you start to see that those remain the issues that South Africans want addressed, and th those have remained the the sort of top two within the top four issues for the last fifteen years of our polling. So the the fact that even your that your ideologically radical weird parties feel the need to position themselves as the problem solvers on these problems just reaffirms the fact that South Africans across the board share problems, share ch challenges, and, and and share aspirations, and that we're seeing in this election campaign a, a fight for who could say to the South African electorate most credibly that we care about a job in your home and we care about the safety of your community. Um, so it's just an affirmation again that the politics of South Africa isn't about transformation. It isn't about whatever ideological fashion that the ruling party and its uh, ideological allies want to push. At the end of the day, the facts of life are that people want to be safe and they want jobs. So it should be a golden opportunity for people like the IRR and uh, society at large to have an honest conversation about, cool, if, if, if the questions are jobs and crime, what works? What has a track record of working? And I think if even the ATM feels the need to sit around that table of discussion, I think I'm, it sort of in a counterintuitive way makes me quite positive about what can be accomplished over the next five years, perhaps not from government and politically, but certainly making use of the shared priorities of South Africans. It's, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's the key point here is that this is a, you know, this is a party that's literally just trying to find everything that's sort of popular with what, uh, with a very large chunk, if not the majority of South Africans. Um, and yet, they're not talking about you know expanding BE necessarily. They do say you know emerges emerging farmers must have uh, priority in in delivering services or something like that. But a lot of it is very kind of vague, and it's not focused on you know getting more uh, executives into top positions at the banks, for example, which and is what the EFF and ANC seem to care the most about. And and you know what this kind of reminds me of is is the end of apartheid in the sense that the the, the the diagnosis, the, what were the obvious problems, became so clear and shared that it became a political battle for who could provide the solutions. And that's actually quite a useful point to be, is where the problems are so clearly diagnosed, it is a, a wonderful 
paradigmatic opportunity for that shift to say, we, we agree on the problems. The diagnosis is in. Now it is about the next step. And, and that's actually a, a relatively welcome, painful position to be. John, anything to add before we move on? No, I think that was a very good observation from Herman. I agree. Okay, let us then move on to our last story about the IEC, which is, well, not exactly inspiring hope <laughs> in the next vote, or at least how they're going to run it. Um, there's still a lot to go, and this isn't the whole story, but uh, according to diplomats who have uh, talked to the media, the IEC has asked South African missions around the world to ask the host country that they're in for election materials rather than providing them themselves. And apparently this is in contrast to how it's normally done. The IEC has provided, you know, voting boxes and, and uh, ballot papers and all that sort of stuff um, uh, in previous elections. But now apparently South African embassies are being asked to provide, to get the host countries to provide that materials from their electoral commissions, uh, which uh, the diplomats have suggested could definitely imperil the validity of some of these votes because you know, uh, some of these countries are not, shall we say, as democratic as South Africa. I mean, I will shudder to think what the uh, procedures <laughs> handed over by the Venezuelan government, for example, will be. Um, John, what do you make of this? This is very uh, odd, isn't it? It is a bit. Um, it's a little, also a little bit concerning um, in the sense that if, if budget cuts really are the reasons for this call from the IEC, then what else is being compromised, right? So if you, if you haven't got enough money to send some cardboard boxes to your overseas missions um, and then to ship the, the ballots back, then what else haven't you got money for? Um, so it's, it's a bit of concerning. And I think that the foreign governments receiving these requests uh, will be possibly be taken aback. But uh, unfortunately, they will also take it as confirmation uh, of their view that South Africa is sort of going down the drain. And they'll say, you know, this is the kind of country that can't supply voting materials to its, to its citizens overseas. Sort of confirms what we've been suspecting for a while. Uh, what a pity, but here we go. Um, so not great, Nick. Definitely. Um, I, this is also not a completely inconsiderate number of votes. I believe that it's about one or two seats worth of votes uh, in parliament that votes outside the country. Um, and also it is... Uh, people who tend to overwhelmingly vote for the opposition. I think the DA usually wins something like 70 to 80% of the overseas votes, um, which is another reason why one, I think, should be a bit suspicious when suddenly the IEC says something funny like this. One does have to ask questions about this. Um, Herman, am I justified in my skepticism? Yes, and, and I think it's quite significantly higher than than one or two seats. I can, I think it, it it is in past elections, it has been the equivalent of one or two seats, but it has the potential to be as many as 10 seats. If, if all South Africans who are outside of the country and have a legal right to vote, vote, um, it, it, it really could be 10 seats in Parliament the last time I looked at the numbers about a year ago. And this is this is the problem. Um, at the end of the day, with any system or any ideological advance that makes merit second to something else. Because at the end of the day, merit does depart. Um, and that merit departs uh, in a slow collapse of credible institutions, just, you know, fading to mediocrity. That's the real problem here, is this is a consequence of cadre deployment. And, uh, you know, where, where the idea wasn't um, the merit and the ability of our hard-won democracy to survive. It was how could the ANC survive and that's cater deployment and so on. So whenever any system uh, moves on from is this person the best person to do the job to any other consideration, the best people to do the job, whatever the cause may be, will end up not doing the job. And that's the real tragedy of the IEC, is I doubt there will be a, a, a breaking point moment where the IEC is in, 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 you know, just drowning in scandal and it's just, it's, it's gone from trusted to not trusted. It, it'll just like, 
it'll just collapse slowly and and take its credibility with it. And that's the really sad thing. And that's why I think the DA call for election observers wasn't wasn't, I think, wrong. But if if, if the ANC doesn't like that, let it Ask other people who it might trust. I mean, ask the Russians, ask the Chinese. The point is that if there's one moment where the maximum number of eyes matter on a process, it is in an election. And the IEC having lost this, um, this credibility, and I think research that was published, I can't remember exactly when, about a year ago, uh, again by the IRR, um, in September last year, by the independent and really high-rated uh, um, election analyst Mike Atkins, one speaks to Mike, and you get this idea that the IEC that ex that oversaw the 1999 and so on elections was really a stuttering yet um, uh, credible bunch of people who thought that election integrity mattered and that their role wasn't just to go along with the government. And the sad thing is, you now have two faults of the IEC emerging, this departure of merit and um, over the last few years, just their willingness to bend the knee to, to the government and not really push for election integrity. So what I would suggest to South Africans is not to, you know, let's not miss the IEC only once it's gone. One, uh, yeah, one can sign up with the IEC to become a independent election observer, or you can become a party agent for whichever political party you support. Um, if you are interested in looking over the, the making sure the procedures are followed correctly. Uh, I believe also the rules are available on the IEC website for the elections. So and, you have time and, if, and, and, and remember that the uh, I, election is a public holiday. And if I could add to, to South Africans who are abroad, write to a member of parliament, write to a member of Congress and say, look, you know, I'm a South African, but I live within your constituency. And I would like you to bring this to your government's attention, that South Africa's democracy, the democracy you associate with Mandela is at risk. And I, I want you to, to take this seriously. Um, because every possible source of influence is useful in the battle of ideas. And foreign governments form part of that. Um, so South Africans who are outside South Africa and are the direct victims of this IEC fumble don't think there's nothing you can do. There's nothing perhaps dramatic and world-changing you can do, but you can help tip the balance of forces by making sure that the appetite for change becomes increasingly great inside and outside of South Africa. I've just posted in the live chat comments on YouTube a report into how South Af how ready will South Africa be for the 2024 elections, which we did with Mike Atkins recently. All right, that's all the time we have for today. Um, John, do you have any final things to add before we close up? Get involved. <laughs> you know, so yeah. you, you, you've got to produce the outcomes you want to see. Um, if you sit on the exactly. sidelines, then you get what other people decide for you. So do get involved, vote, observe, speak out, write letters, do something. Exactly. I think that is, if everyone goes and is an election observer, uh, wherever you live, it will definitely help the process to run smoother. Also, it's a pretty interesting day. I've done it before mm -hmm. as a party agent. Um, I have quite enjoyed myself. You meet some interesting people. You usually get to meet people from a variety of political parties. Uh, it's, and you learn a lot about the country and the way uh, it works. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. See you soon.